Okay, I think we should probably begin now. Thank you very much. I'm always delighted when anybody comes to see me speak. So, you know, this is, this is more than my wildest dreams already. Thank you so much. The, uh, the, the, the timings on today are very tight. So I appreciate that as teachers, we're very good at getting from one classroom to the next. So that's brilliant. Um, thank you for coming. My name is Tom Bennett. I am the, the, the founder of Research Ed, um, a, a kitchen table phenomena, which, which is doing quite well. And what I want to do in this session is basically explain what we're about, what we do, what our aims are, how we achieved it, and what we intend to do next. Um, I will take some questions at the end. We only have about 40 minutes, so I will be mercifully brief. Okay? If you have any questions throughout, by all means, put your hand up, and I will, I will try not to ignore as many people as possible. Um, I try not to do speeches or lectures when I'm running a conference because it's like having two heart attacks at once. So, you know, this is a rarity for me. Um, research Ed, what can I say? Well, first of all, a little bit by myself. I am still a teacher. I've been teaching now for about 13 years. Uh, last year, I went part-time to run this beautiful beast. So I'm doing one day a week as a teacher. I'm still hanging on by my fingernails because I enjoy the, 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 the job so much. When I entered the profession, I was uh, deeply immersed in the, the British education, uh, sorry, initial teacher training into, into being a teacher. And there was a lot of stuff I was taught then which later turned out to be, shall we say, less substantiated than people claimed it was. Um, I, I don't know if anybody here remembers things like Brain Gym. You do know Brain Gym over here. Good, I mean bad, but good, because it makes my metaphor work here. Um, Brain Gym is a, is a perfect example of something which was tremendously popular in the UK uh, in almost every school I've ever been in, people were talking about Brain Gym. You remember, of course, Brain Gym is the one where you have to rub your brain buttons, two of, two of which are here. And, of course, it, it, it improves the oxygen to your brain, which therefore improves cognitive flow, which doesn't exist. I don't even know what that is. You know, and stuff like this was getting through into classrooms. Now, that's kind of a silly example, but it's an important example because it shows how vulnerable education is to fads, fashions, and pseudoscience. That was my initial reaction with educational research. And I would go into classrooms as a brand new teacher, wide-eyed, looking far, far younger than the, the 32 I am now. And uh, thank you, don't laugh, thank you. And, <laughs> and I would go in, and of course you would accept what you were told by your trainers, by your mentors, by your school leaders. The whole of the ecosystem was infected with these ideas. Not entirely, not everywhere, but enough for it to be common. Um, and there was other things, for example, I struggled with. Um, I was when I was trained, I was told that the best way for all children to learn was through group work. Now, I do <laughs> I'm not the biggest fan of group work in the world, but I do see uses for group work. But what really made me struggle as a teacher was trying to force children into working in groups when that wasn't a good thing for them to be doing. There are some tasks, for example, which are much better done by yourself or in pairs or depending on who you are. And I think that's the big thing that was often missing in certainly my teacher education, which was we were often told universals. Everybody had to do this. Everybody had to work in groups and so on. So I would spend weeks and weeks and weeks planning lessons of getting children working in groups, even if the children were, uh, had very severe behavior issues. You know, and they'll be working, or they'll be looking at each other, or they'll be trying to work out the history of the, uh, the Reformation in pairs by themselves when they're 11 years old, you know, because this is the best way to do it. Now, this is just an example. And I spent years before I realized that you could even question that. <laughs> it was years before I realized that you could actually say, actually, that doesn't work for me. But the people above me and round about me kept saying, no, 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 but the research shows this. So my first experience of research was a bad one. I was very angry with research. I wrote a book called Teacher Proof. It was a very angry book. I was very angry with my father. No, I was very angry with research because I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed. I mean, if I wrote the book again today, it would be a very different book because of my experiences through research, Ed, and thankfully it's been a lot more positive. But what it showed me was that the relationship between academia, the world of research, 
schools, the world of teachers, school leaders, intermediaries, charities, private trusts, that the whole ecosystem was like a jungle where it was possible for almost any bad idea to get out there, no matter how bad. And, and somebody would listen to it, and somebody would say, ah, well, the research shows that. That was the phrase that kills me, the research shows that. When somebody says to you, yes, but the research shows that, your job is to say, which research? Can I see it? <laughs> you know, call their bluff. And then they might call your bluff, and you have to read it. This is the problem, right? Damn it. But if enough of us start asking these questions as educators, ah, then maybe things can change. So I was online one day. I say that as if it was an unusual occurrence. I'm always online. I exist on Twitter. Right? I've basically uploaded myself onto the internet now. I very rarely appear in three dimensions these days. This is quite unusual. Um, I was having a, a discussion online between a couple of people whom I respect a great deal. Sam Friedman, who is uh, Director of Research for uh, the ARC Schools in the UK, and Ben Goldacre, who's a, a, a doctor and a, a very, very powerful and quite famous advocate for better science in medicine. And I was, I was railing about educational science, and they said, well, why don't you hold a conference? So it was a bet. And you can't say no to a bet, obviously. So I put one tweet out. It was the tweet that roared. It was the tweet that was heard around the world. <laughs> I, was, I was so fortunate. I said, who wants to help me put on an educational conference about research? Right. Which, on the face of it, isn't the sexiest of ideas. <laughs> you know, who wants to help me do something really boring? I was up until 3 o'clock that morning uh, answering, responding to emails, responding to tweets. I woke up the next day for school. I had 200 emails in my inbox, people offering to speak to host, to help, to sponsor, to clear up, to make bags, to design logos. It was astonishing. Research Ed has become very, well, I would say, hopefully quite successful. Not because of me, but despite of me. I think it was something that wanted to happen anyway. And I've just been fortunate enough to be kind of riding the, the horse, as it were. Um, we had a venue. We launched a conference. It sold out. We had some of the best speakers in the UK. I couldn't believe the people that said yes to us. I couldn't believe the people that asked if they could speak. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And we, so we had the day, very much like this day, where it was a roughly, say, 70, 70, 80% people working in schools, maybe another 10% in academia, 10% research. And, you know, if, there's, if, if I've got any percentages left there, people who are intermediaries and charities and policymakers and so on, which for me was just the right blend because the voice that was missing in this conversation was teacher voice. Teacher voice, teacher voice, teacher voice. I mean, I know we have unions, and they can do a, a terrific job sometimes, but this isn't really the medium for what unions are doing. Unions tend to look at terms and conditions and so on and pay. Um, I want to talk about pedagogy. I want to talk about professional conditions in terms of what we actually do as teachers. The day went fantastically. I thought it was going to die off after that. I just said, that's enough. It was like a six-month heart attack for me just to organize this. Um, we had a terrific mix of people. And again, we had teachers, we had academics and researchers all talking on the same day. You often get conferences where it's full of academics. You get conferences which are full of teachers. You know, but it's very unusual you get them all together in the same room. Uh, they often feel that they don't have much to say to each other. Well, I think that's, that's so wrong. I think that's so wrong. I have met... I have met many academics who sadly don't want to engage with teachers. I've met, I, there were some academics in the UK whom I won't name who said to me, why do we want to talk to teachers? Educational researchers who didn't want to talk to teachers. I said, well, that's great. <laughs> Go back to your room. <laughs> Lock yourself in. We'll feed you three times a day. Um, and there are many teachers who don't want to engage with research, and, and I don't blame them, because my initial reaction was, get research the hell out of my classroom. Look at all the bad things it's done. That was my initial reaction. Until I realized there was so much great research out there, because what is research? Uh, but this, you know, the structured understanding of the experiences of humankind. There is good research, and there is bad research. And I want to try and help educators raise their, can we call it research literacy? Not that we all become researchers. We can't. You may have noticed that we have jobs. 
You, know, you might be quite busy in schools. So the idea that teachers should be researchers isn't something I promote terribly strongly, unless they have got time and resources and are supported and doing it as part of a formal process and so on. I'm not a big fan of teachers just going off to do an experiment, because most of us don't know how. And doing an experiment, doing proper science, good social science, is, is difficult. It's challenging. It's not for the amateur. However, teachers engaging with research and research engaging with teachers, ah, now that's a prize to be gained. So that's something we wanted to try and focus on very, very much. So raise the research literacy of teachers so that enough of us were literate enough about research that we as a community could share that literacy amongst ourselves. Do you, do you know the, 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 the phrase, uh, a herd immunity? Uh, if you know this, in, 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 you know, when you inoculate people against a virus, as long as you get enough people inoculated, then it's very hard for a virus to spread because thankfully enough people can't be carriers. I think that's kind of what I, I see research literacy as being like. Enough teachers knowing just enough about research to be at least critically minded, but also open to understanding where they can access great research, which might be really useful for them. Teaching is very much a craft. It's very much about what you do in the classroom and how you experience it and how you learn and what you learn from people around about you and what you learn from children. It is absolutely very much a craft. There is also an aspect of teaching which is amenable to the scientific method. There are some aspects of what we do which can be studied, possibly quantified or qualified and understood. And it's the intersection between these two things which is incredibly powerful. I've heard teachers say to me, oh, I don't want to know about research. Well, I think they, they probably should. They probably should. I think it's very easy for us as teachers to become very intimate with our ex own experiences and think that only those experiences are true. You know, only what I do works. I'm reminded of, um, of doctors in the 16th and 17th century who resisted science coming into their sacred territory. There were doctors, for example, see, see if this sounds familiar to you. There were doctors that would say, I don't need science. I don't, I don't need to know about germ theory because I know my patient better than anybody else does. And this is where medicine was. And in a sense, this is where teaching is to some extent. And I think if we can, if we can find a, a great space between, between experience and between structured experience, or can I say between craft and science, then I think we could become very, very powerful indeed. Research head days are based on roughly this model, which is to say we hold them on Saturdays so that teachers can come. <laughs> so that teachers can come. And don't get me wrong, I know that teachers can often come out of school on conferences and so on, but that is if their leaders and line managers allow them to. This is up to you. And also it means that the people that come to these events are normally quite committed, if not slightly crazy. <laughs> but at least they're curious, they're interested. And we see this of people of all ages and backgrounds. And it's fascinating for me to, to look at the people that we get at Research Ed. And it really is a beautiful uh, cross-section of the sector. We try to make them very low cost. This is not about making money for anybody, I assure you, I, I guarantee you. <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a cost in many ways, um, but a beautiful one to do so as well. We, we try and make sure that every conference breaks even, so that we, we, we walk out with empty pockets, but, a, but a, a heart full of love. Thank you, you're welcome, I just thought of that. Um, <laughs> and a mind full of thought. And that's the way it should be, because I don't want cost to be a barrier to anyone coming. And, the, and here's the great thing. If you get people to volunteer for things and do things for nothing, that sure helps that a lot. None of our speakers are paid. Um, the venue often only charges cost price, you know, what it costs them to put it on so that they're not out of pocket as well. The speakers will get paid. We sometimes pay a little bit of travel expenses and so on to help people. But it's such, a, it's such an act of collective generosity. That it is, it, it, you know, it's, it, it humbles me every time we do this. And that helps keep these costs down. You go to conferences where speakers ask for thousands and thousands of euros. And, you know, we, we couldn't do that. So it's a blend of voices. And that, I think, is a very powerful thing. We have a blend of voices. At our last national conference, we had uh, Nick Gibb, the schools minister, 
and we had somebody who had just qualified as a primary school teacher speaking, you know, next door to each other. That's very exciting. And we've got a very similar thing here today as well, so I'm very pleased to see that too. And the emphasis is always on dialogue, speaking to one another, and something useful to take away. This, we try not to make this about people uh, pontificating in very abstract terms. Nothing wrong with that, because in a sense, sometimes science has to pursue very abstract aims. Science and knowledge and learning should be valued for itself. But these days, these events, the research at events, we try to make reasonably practical so that somebody could come away with an idea which is practical for them, I hope. You can, you can tell me if we succeed at the end of the day, okay? Um, I've already mentioned this. I think teachers need to become research literate to become, as I called my slightly angry book, teacher-proof. We, we need to be resistant to fads and fashions. We need to be able to confidently stand up and say, I'm not sure if that's correct or true. Now, in a sense, that that's an act of politics. Because that is, this is why I call research ed a polite revolution. Because in its own way, that's quite radical. I spent years and years as a teacher being told what to do, well, understandably. We all exist within a system. But with no say as to whether or not that was true, valid, or meaningful as an instruction or a decision. When we collectively start to access the research and evidence behind decisions, we become tremendously powerful, especially collectively, of course, but often individually too. All it takes is one person asking, what's the evidence behind that assertion? All it takes is one person to say that for the question to be raised. So sometimes individually, we can also be quite powerful too. Um, so th this was my first intention behind research ed. I wanted us to stop being seduced by the latest fad or fashion. I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of it in education just now. I mean, learning styles is, learning styles is this? <coughs> learning styles, of course, conquered the world and still does. There are many people who claim that learning styles um, isn't taught anymore. It absolutely is. I just put one tweet out a, a few months ago. Who learns learning styles these days? <laughs> Drowned in it. It exists particularly in business. Business, is, is, business is, I think, is, is sick beyond repair here. <laughs> Teaching might still be able to be saved, although we may have to amputate a few limbs. But um, things like that last a long time. We call them zombie theories because they, they last a long time even after they're dead. And sometimes even a headshot doesn't stop them. Um, learning styles are great, though. I, 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 I could talk about them all day long. I mean, there are lots of different theories of learning styles, but the VAK, this is the most popular one, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. I often wonder what happens to the gestatory learners, the, the olfactory learners, what happens to them? These people are marginalized. They're not, they're not dealt with in school. Okay. Um, I realized after my initial anger about research, ed, you know, get it the hell out of my life, was that we could actually start to participate in research and become discerning analysts, not merely passive recipients. Because, of course, there's something else which I've discovered in, in the years we've been running research, ed, which is that research in the laboratory often becomes a very different creature once it hits the classroom. I call this the magic mirror. Somebody can come up with a perfectly good piece of research. Now, good research is often hard to understand. You know, it's often complex. It's often subtle. It's often nuanced. Good research often says, in some cases, this has been observed. Good research is careful. Good research tends not to say this will work with all children. But you let that free of the laboratory. What happens? Somebody with a budget gets hold of it. Somebody in policy gets hold of it. Somebody wants to make a name for themselves. And then the poor teacher gets rained upon with certainty. And you must do this. And all children will experience this. This is the terrible thing. I call it the magic mirror. It's not as nice as it sounds. Because it's a lens. It's a, it's a circus mirror where things become distorted and contorted into something that they're not. Some of you may be familiar, for example, with the work of Dylan William. Dylan William is, is, is an extraordinarily good uh, academic researcher and also I call educator but also communicator. He's wonderful at speaking to teachers. He's, he's got that rare gift of being astonishingly intelligent and able to, and able to, and able to share his ideas with teachers without 
s oversimplifying them. Very, I mean, I, I get him to speak whenever I can. He's gold dust. He's absolutely brilliant. And he came up with assessment for learning. Well, he came up with a study on assessment for learning. You know, the uh, assessment for learning is something which has landed here. Thank you. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, assessment for learning is is, 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 is is a wonderful database on that, about what works and what doesn't work with children and when it should be done. But of course, what happens when it reaches the classrooms? It becomes tick boxes. Have you done your assessment for learning yet? You know? We, uh, we leveled children. We gave children levels in schools. And a level was meant to be an indicator of how the children were performing at the end of several years. It was meant to be a, a, a holistic, global opinion of the child's ability. But of course, what did we do with it in schools? We turned it into homework. We leveled pieces of homework. We leveled children three times a week. We, you know, we, leveled, we leveled children by doing this. It was a disaster. And even Dillian William reacted with sad disappointment at what had happened to his very, very good ideas. So schools have a responsibility here too. This isn't just me criticizing bad academia. You know, schools are also partly responsible for this. How do we get past this? Being more research literate, being a more powerful professional community. And incidentally, one of the loveliest things about research ed is how international we've become. We're okay for time. Um, We've taken research ed to New York. We've held research ed in Sydney. We were in Amsterdam a couple of months ago. Uh, we've, we've now come to Gothenburg. You know, the, the fruit of Scandinavia, the cream of Scandinavia is here today. We're so honored. Uh, we're going to go to Washington DC in September or October. We've got a national conference coming up. We've got loads of UK conferences. Uh, we're looking at Germany. We're looking at Canada. Because we've been invited to these places. And you know what? Educators from all around the world can talk to each other and share these same ideas, and that is so powerful. You know, it is an international grassroots movement, which maybe we've helped to catalyze, but we're not the cause of this. This is something which wants to happen. This is teachers and educators, catalyzed maybe more by social media, I think, and the communication possibilities offered by the internet, finally realizing that they can talk to one another and share their experiences. 30 years ago, if you had a good idea in your classroom, the most you could do is tell people in your staff room. Yeah? Nowadays, you can go online, and rant and rage, and a minister can read it. They wouldn't tell you that they can read it, or their advisor will read it. You can hold a conference in Sydney about educational research, as I may have done, and find it in the UK. It's trending in Twitter all day long. <laughs> Across the other side of the planet, because people are following it online and following the hashtag. You should be hashtagging this, by the way. I expect all of the, all of you who are looking down right now, you better be checking your mails. You should be hashtagging this. Okay? So anyway, I want to help schools, help teachers, and also to drive a model of autonomy, reprofessionalism, continuing professional development, and political enfranchisement. These are modest aims, I hope. <laughs> These are modest aims. But for instance, we can drive our own training by coming to events like this or developing more events. Because the great thing about days like this is you can pick the sessions you want to go to. So you can start to catalyze the things that you're interested in for yourself rather than waiting for your line manager to tell you what your next priority is going to have to be. I find that very refreshing. I'm going to stop in six or seven minutes and take some questions, okay? Yeah, I talked about that. <coughs> I think, see, I've covered most of this. This is my problem. Okay, I'll talk about this. <laughs> I also think it's very important for teachers and educators to challenge their own orthodoxies. You have to, if you're part of the experience, you have to murder your children to some extent. I believe that's a phrase used in writing, but also I think it's true in educational theory. Um, I'm often accused of being too certain about what I believe. Let me assure you, this is a mask. I am racked with doubt. I am racked with fraud syndrome more than anything else, as I assure you. Uh, but I'm racked with doubt and the insecurity of not being sure about what I know. That's not a front. I think that's a good thing to have, if I'm honest. It's like the Socratic idea of, uh, of at least knowing that you don't know things. 
I think it's a very useful tool for teachers not to be too certain about what they believe works in their classroom. And that includes the things that I believe work in the classroom. I'm a big believer, for example, in things like direct instruction. I'm a fairly traditional teacher. I, I, like, uh, <laughs> I like rows and columns in my classroom. I know that in some countries that I get sent to prison for saying that, but uh, I quite like these kind of things. Uh, I think there's evidence to reasonably back that up, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. And I think the more as teachers we, we don't cling too heavily to what we believe as being the truth sent down by God, then I think that's a very useful experience for us all to realize because when I see debates in education, I see people clutched by certainty. And I think good science encourages us to be humble. Good science encourages us to ask, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong? I'm always inspired by the work of the, uh, the physicist Feynman who worked on the American Manhattan Project that developed the atomic bomb. I mean, that's not why he's a hero of mine or anything, but um, he's, a, he's a brilliant man. And again, another great scientist who was a very good communicator. And if you ever get a chance, read things by Feynman. He's, anybody can read his work. I mean, I'm sure not his physics, but, his, but his, his science work. And he, this kind of opened my eyes a lot. He said, in physics, we have to do so much to be able to say, even to some extent, that we think we might know something. We have to do so much. We have to test our theories again and again and again. We have to try and destroy our own theories. We have to try and prove why our own theories might be wrong. And he said, and then I look at social science, and I wonder, I wonder if they even know what they're saying. And I think there was a good message in that. I think that when we're involved in social science, which is what we're essentially involved in, Education is a kind of a, a cauldron, a stew of different forms of social science. I think it becomes even more important that we're very, very cautious about our findings, that we share our findings, that we try and make sure that the findings we come across are read in context of our own experience and not simply as items of certainty. Daniel Willingham, who is another person I respect a great deal, the cognitive psychologist from the University of Virginia who spoke for us in New York, is um, he's very good at talking about this. He's very good at, he, d he delivered a speech for us about how do you persuade people to engage with science and research who don't like science and research. Now, as a cognitive psychologist, he's got a lot to say about persuasion and motivation and interest and so on. And it, I found his, what he said was fascinating. And basically, one of the things he said was that we often identify our beliefs with our identity. And so sometimes when you challenge some people's ideas and beliefs, for them, it's an attack on their identity. So if somebody sees themselves as being uh, very, very right-wing or very, very left-wing, and they've got certain views about, I don't know, you know, immigration or school vouchers or something like that, it's not just an idea they have in their head. It's part of who they are. This is a natural and human thing. I am not immune to this. You know, I can't remember, was it, was it Herzl who said, that when we think that we are not in the grip of ideology, we are most in the grip of ideology. I I maybe he said that, or if he didn't, then I'm claiming it, because it's true. You know, and, and I include myself in that. Um, it's very hard to, as Kant would say, step out of the phenomena into the noumena. It's very hard to leave that, that your, your own kind of uh, belief system. But we have to try. We have to try. I'm a very strong believer. I did philosophy at university because... Um, because that's where all the money is, obviously. <laughs> I ended up working in bars for 10 years. <laughs> As you can tell, I ended up running nightclubs in London, Soho for five years. So it was a natural progression from that into teaching <laughs> religious education and then running research conferences. It's, a, it's the perfect training ground. And, um, but one of the things I admired about philosophy, about learning philosophy, was that you could sit in a lecture one day and listen to a lecture on Karl Marx I think this, this is astonishing. He's got it. This man, this man has cracked it. You know, he's, he's, he, I'm a Marxist. Where do I join up? Next week, you can sit in a lesson by, I don't know, Adam Smith or Friedman or something like that. And you go, oh, my God, I'm a free market capitalist. <laughs> the market is the only solution to everything. You know, quick, shut all the state schools, open all the free schools. And that's the great thing about philosophy. Your ideas can be very versatile. And it's okay, it's okay to do that. 
it's okay to flip-flop between ideas. and Oh, that's wrong. Oh, no, maybe this is right. That's fine. That's fine. As long as, as, long as you don't, you know, as long as you don't do it five times a day, and confuse your friends. So I think we need to dislocate ourselves a little bit from our ideology, dislocate ourselves a little bit from our dogma, and which, which are often simply the assumptions which have come up through our childhood and our teenage years and our younger years. I see some of you are still nearly in your teenage years. Makes me feel terribly old, thank you. If we can do that, if as teachers we can learn to embrace caution, optimism, but also challenge in our work, and then bring that into our discussions, and learn the intersection between the formal processes of social science and the informal processes of experiential craft-based teaching, I think there's something very exciting in that new territory. I think that's the territory I want to be in for the rest of my natural career until I, until I fall down. I read, somewhere <laughs> I read somewhere that the life expectancy for a teacher in the UK after they retire is five years. That's why I'm still doing one day a week. <laughs> my theory is I will live forever if I just keep doing that one day a week. I'm going to stop now because I've basically outlined the, the, the kind of theory and history of research. There's a lot more I could say about what we've been doing and so on. We've launched a website, which you're more than welcome to shout at and have, say hello at. We're trying to redevelop it this year so that it becomes a much more of a, a tool. But on the website, we try and store as many of the videos, sorry, the films, I just dated myself there, as many of the films and the speakers and the sessions as we can record because most speakers give up their sessions and say that's fine, you can use them. We try and store the PowerPoints, we try and put some news up there, we try and let people know about future conferences and so on. We are always looking for new partners to work with. Research Ed only exists as a series of a thousand partnerships across the world which spring up and fall down as they're needed and required. Um, I mean, Sarah Kjelm has been, has been an inspiration for this event and also the driving force. She has been the nuclear powered uh, ambition behind today's event. And that's, that's what we've been blessed to do in many, many situations and locales. We partner up with local people. We partner up with local talent. We partner up with schools. We partner up with people who care about this kind of thing. And we come together and somehow it works. Somehow it works. So far, so good. Um, if we, we would love to, I guess, I'm going to be honest, I would love to come back to this part of the world, if anybody wants to work with us in the future, if anybody has a beautiful castle-like school <laughs> on a Bavarian slope, I know Bavaria is in Germany, but still, um, then please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have an enormous sack of gold and diamonds <laughs> to, to, to pay for our station, then by all means let me know as well. Um, but that's the story of who we are. That's what we believe. It, it has coalesced and become more and more real as the days have gone by. It has gone from a kitchen table business to a large kitchen table business. My kitchen table is now bigger, but I do still work from my kitchen table. Um, I'm very proud of that, and I'm very proud of what so many people have achieved within Research Ed, and I hope it continues for a long, long time to come. Any questions? Good, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, sir, we have no. I don't think we have a mic. So, yeah. 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 Mm. Mm -hmm. I hate. I hate to say it, but you've asked an excellent question. You know what, speakers always say, that's an excellent question, when it's a challenging question. So that's an excellent question, sir. Um, it would be facetious and dishonest of me to say that I, of course, don't have a lens of my own. Of course. I try and make these events more than just the Tom Bennett Roadshow, though. I try and bring in speakers who I disagree with, but whom I respect, because I feel that like they're doing important work in their field. Let me give an example. The very first event we ran, I invited a speaker called Frank Ferretti, who is an English sociologist, whom I, uh, I've read all of his books, and I agree with half of what he says passionately, and the other half I disagree with passionately. And one of his, one of his principal points is that, edu that education is not a science and cannot be researched meaningfully. 
and that social science is, is often junk science and so on. So I invited him to come to the conference to deliver that because, because that's, a, but a, because I actually kind of, I get where he's coming from. You know, the old cynic in me agreed with him to an extent, but also because I felt like his views would be like the grit inside an oyster that makes a pearl to some extent. You need that friction to have challenge to make great ideas. I mean, we're talking about the classic synthesis here of great ideas, which isn't to say, of course, that of course there's, I don't curate the event. I do curate the event. It's not just, oh, come on, then let's talk about research, everybody. Because to some extent, I do have to draw a boundary of people who have what I believe are unsubstantiated claims, of people who I believe are uh, promoting junk science or selling a product, or who are simply zealots or advocates for their own position. I try to avoid that. Um, having said that, there are many, many people at each conference with whom I disagree because this is much more than me. And also, it's not just me anymore deciding. Um, I've also got the work of, I don't know if she's in the room, uh, Helena Shi. she may be next door. Is Helena here? No. Um, and she and I often have very different views about education. So she helps curate as well. And then we often ask, I have an advisory panel, and I ask them to sometimes help. And we invite submissions, and people can, can submit too. So you, I mean, you're absolutely right. My, I guess my defense would be, nobody would ever be completely free of their own ideology. But I do try and make sure that there's people there that I think you know, that are completely wrong but I respect their wrongness because I may, I may be the one that's wrong. So it's much more than just me, and it always will be. And as this grows, it has to be otherwise. You know, th this, isn't, this is not a vehicle of self-promotion, I assure you. Um, I mean, I enjoy that, <laughs> but, but it's not, that's not what it's about. So you know, you're right, and I need people to keep challenging me and saying, yeah, but why aren't you looking at this? My first conference was very, very heavily biased towards quantitative research because I think as... As I'm a bit of a positivist, and th I think that's where I felt safest. And as I started to relax and just chill out a little bit, I realized, no, let's get more qualitative research in there. Let's get, the, let's get different kind of data sets in there. Uh, let's, get, let's get stuff there that I don't understand. You know, it's got to be. Anyone else? Has anyone got an easier question? Has anyone got a nice, soft question about my favorite, you know, <laughs> Swedish food or something? <laughs> Meatballs, obviously. Rotten shark. Philippa. Oh, you do have a microphone. Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I'd be. There's a there's a thing trending from other rooms about whether teachers should have access to research journals, and I'm in two minds about this. The research journals are, by and large, designed entirely to feed the HE funding system, and you know, and also to mm -hmm. service something that I respect, which is peer review, but. No, it's a quite cloudy, murky area, yes. and they're funded by the public. Yes. You know, all of the writing, all of the editing, all of the review is, is funded by the public purse, but they're extraordinarily expensive, and just look what's happened to the research journal profits since mm -hmm. research assessments exercises internationally started to be fed by them. So I'm in two minds. Mm. I, I can see pros and cons, and also I don't think they're terribly well written, and they're not written for teachers. Mm. But equally, if you think about a research journal for teachers... Uh, you know, some teachers would feel, um, you know, put down by that. So I, I, I can see arguments in mm. lots of different ways. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I also, I also have strong mixed feelings. If it's possible to have strong mixed feelings, I do. And I've had this discussion before many times. On one, s in one sense, I was, I was lucky enough to go to the University of Cambridge. I did a short um, fellowship there. I was a teacher fellow. I used to stride about wearing a cloak in Cambridge University, pretending to be somebody when I wasn't. And I used to go to the University of Cambridge Education Faculty Library, which is an enormous library of journals, stretching on like the, the last scene out of Indiana Jones, forever and ever and ever. Books that have never been read, covered in dust. And this is in the education faculty. This is, this is where they'll be read most. And I would look at some of them and there's a really good report, I think it's the Thule report, was it 2001, which, which sampled lots of educational research and just found that a great deal of it was, was really junk. Or it was ideology wrapped, dressed up as, as research, or it was simply self-promotion or something. Um, a lot of research is terrible. And for that reason, I wasn't such a huge supporter of, yeah, let's make research free access for teachers. Because... A teacher with little training in accessing research might come across something which was terrible and go, oh, this is brilliant. Oh, you know, this is it. I'm going to do this now. 
I'm going to get all my children to jump off cliffs or something. And then the, there's another side of the argument promoted by, well, people like yourself, Laura, <laughs> um, who say, yeah, but the, the classic liberal ideal of freedom of speech means that if you expose as many people as possible to as many ideas as possible, eventually the, you know, eventually the truth will come out and don't patronize people because somebody will understand. And in the, and in the conversational ecosystem, that's a healthy thing. I think I now tend more towards that, I'll be honest. I think it's now, it's, it's, it's probably a good thing for teachers to have fairly unfettered access to research, even though it may, may expose them to bad ideas. Because then you, have the, then you have the same argument about the internet. Should people be allowed to access the internet? Yeah, because they might, they might meet something scary, you know? And I think that's a good argument for children. I do think that's right for children, but I don't think that's right for adults, or however you want to define the, the gray area in between. So I would argue that it probably is a good thing to have free access. I think actually what it might do, it might make people sharpen up their acts. It might make people call out the junk a bit more. Do we have time for a follow-up, Philip? And that's my, that's my big question. We do not. It's now one minute over. I want to say thank you so much for coming. Have a lovely day. And go see other people who are better than me. Thank you very much. Thank you.